A hundred years ago, long before television and mass tourism, there was only one way to see the world. Huge fairs were staged in every great city, bringing the world to the public. From Italian gondolas to African elephants. But it wasn't just animals and objects that were exhibited. Live human beings were put on display. These were human zoos. These exhibitions were not meant just as entertainments. They were masterminded by scientists and designed to demonstrate the superiority of the white race. The average white man is stronger of limb, fleeter of foot, clearer of eye than the average yellow or red or black. Human zoos taught the public that racism was scientific. This new science of race would inspire and feed the ideology of the Nazis, giving academic grounding to the 20th century's greatest atrocity. This is the story of the human zoos and their legacy, buried by history until now. Almost nothing is known about the people who were put in human zoos, but one man's story can be pieced together. His name was Otta Benga. He was a pygmy from the Congo. Otta Benga would pass through the hands of four of America's leading scientists. The anthropologist William McGee, the zoologist William Temple Horniday, and Madison Grant, America's greatest racist and the author of Hitler's favorite book. But Otto Benga's journey to the human zoo would begin with the explorer Samuel Phillips Werner. At the beginning of the 20th century, Werner was one of the world's leading experts on pygmies. He'd even lived among them in the Congo. My grandfather, he wanted to uh, show the world that there were these people and acquaint their civilization with ours. He thought that this would be sensational. I don't think my grandfather would have liked this environment. It's too artificial for him. I'm here to show you this uh, picture that was taken of my grandfather, Werner. I think he's a rather handsome fellow. Well, he was very adventurous. Uh, some thought it was to such an extreme that uh, perhaps he was a little daft or crazy or a little bit like many in the Werner family have been over the years. He saw the pygmies as people who were very close to nature and had a wonderful knowledge of who ate what and uh, how they uh, could cure diseases with various concoctions and how to poison an elephant. You realize a, a single pygmy could bring down an entire bull elephant single-handedly. I don't think that any of us could do that. In 1903, Werner got his chance to show pygmies to the world. I don't think it's in there now. I think it's in here. An anthropologist offered to pay him to bring pygmies to America. If he pulled off the feat, it could catapult Werner into the A-list of famous explorers, next to Stanley and Livingston. But first, he had to meet his employer's list of demands. Yeah, here we go. Here we are. Uh, what is to be procured? estimates of the cost. This is it. One pygmy patriarch or chief, one adult woman, preferably his wife, one adult man, preferably his son, one adult woman, the wife of the last or daughter of the first, one female youth unmarried, one female youth unmarried not nearly related to the last, two infants of women in the expedition, a priestess and a priest, or medicine doctors, preferably old. All of the above 12 to be pygmies. Oh, that's quite a, quite a list. Werner was actually thinking he could do this. But Werner's amazing adventure was not unique. A century ago, before we could travel the world as tourists, the only way we could witness how other races lived was to visit an ethnic show, or human zoo with live specimens that explorers had brought back for our entertainment. 
we're talking about millions of people going to see these shows when they're at their peak in terms of scale, in terms of cost, in terms of the amount of investment that's going into them. Human zoos were such a big draw that every major city had to stage one. Some of the most spectacular were in Paris, Chicago, Hamburg and London. In 1924, King George V and Queen Mary inspected the live exhibits at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley. Everyone wanted to be in on the act. Sometimes it's missionary people and they're putting on the shows to raise funds for missionary activity. Sometimes it's very much entrepreneurs taking advantage, being able to import people and just make a bit of money. Sometimes it's anthropologists and they claim it's for scientific reasons. So there's absolutely no doubt that there is such a thing as race and there's absolutely no shame or reluctance to talk about race. And the exhibits became ever more extravagant. Eventually, explorers' tales were brought to life by recreating entire villages. Originally, often you just get, for example, a show within a local theatre and you go along for a couple of hours. Whereas by the later 19th century, you can often have hundreds, if not a couple of thousand people on a single site eating and they're constantly on display. One of the most popular British exhibitions was held in 1899. It was called Savage South Africa. The natives were so keenly awaited that they were asked to perform to the crowds as soon as they stepped off the boat at Southampton Docks. By the time they made it to Earl's Court Exhibition Centre in London, their ringmasters were making them restage great battles from across the empire. So, for example, one thing that they do is reconstruct a raid by Africans um, during the Matebele Wars. And there's actually a film of this, and it's some of the earliest footage of Africans on film. And you've got the Dutchmen lined up, and you've got the Africans coming in and kind of <laughs> seeming to attack them. And it's very, very much in the vein of spectacular visual entertainment. In the end, the show proved almost too popular. Savage South Africa causes quite a stir because at one point women are banned from going into Earl's Court because they've supposedly been touching their natives. Scientists were also desperate to get their hands on the natives. At the end of the 19th century, academics were only just beginning to study humankind in scientific terms. This new science of anthropology saw human zoos as an opportunity to investigate humanity close up. Living labs where they could study all of the races in one place. One of the first American anthropologists spotted the potential of human zoos and set his sights on building the biggest and most popular human zoo ever with more human specimens than any other. His name was William McGee. McGee always had to do everything bigger more showy and just in your face, I am the best. He was a stubborn, ambitious individual, but he was also one of the greatest and most well-known scientists of the last century. McGee's human zoo would be more than spectacular public entertainment. McGee had a point to prove to the public. Those who know the races realize that the average white man is stronger of limb, fleeter of foot, clearer of eye, and far more enduring of body under stress of labor and hardship than the average yellow or red or black. Despite the special proficiency along a few narrow lines sometimes displayed by the lower types and drawn large in traveler's tail. What he wanted to do in St. Louis was show people how human beings had developed and how human cultures and races had developed. He decided to bring the extreme. He wanted to get the tallest people in the world, and he thought they were people from Patagonia, which is down at the tip of South America. Okay? Since there was the tallest people in the world, he wanted the smallest people in the world. So he went over, he sent an expedition over to the Belgian Congo in that area to get pygmies. 
He wanted the Ainu, who were up in this island north of Japan, supposedly the hairiest people in the world. He also wanted the, what he considered the most primitive American Indian group, which was the Kokopa in Mexico. McGee wanted the Eskimo, people from South Africa. Logistically, it was a nightmare. The biggest nightmare belonged to McGee's special agent, the explorer and pygmy expert Samuel Phillips Werner. To bring back pygmies for McGee, he had to embark on a daredevil trip into the heart of Africa. He was just excited by every bit of it. He was that kind of a guy. If you told him that a place was dangerous, he'd say, I want to go there. I have here an old map showing the world as it was at the time my grandfather made his voyages to Africa. My grandfather got on board a ship uh, in in New York, first went to London, and then all the way down the European coast and around Africa to the Congo River. And he made his way up the Congo River with steamers as far as it would go. But once he arrived at the area where the great waterfalls were, he had to hire a crew of natives to take everything by hand up thousands of feet of waterfall country. Now he had to encounter uh, crocodiles and hippopotamuses that would upset the boats and some of the areas in the river they had great whirlpools that would, if you fell into them or your boat went into them, you would completely drown and you'd be thrown out on the side of a cliff somewhere. He did actually get malaria but he swore to the end of his days that he got that in the swamps of South Carolina, uh, not in Africa. But Werner's adventures would change the way the Western world saw race forever. In 1904, the anthropologist William McGee was putting the finishing touches to his human zoo. It was designed to be one of the largest scientific experiments ever undertaken. But before it had even begun, McGee was sure of the conclusion. It was designed to prove to the public that there was a hierarchy of races, with the white man at the top and everyone else beneath. McGee was trying to develop a universalizing theory of uh, human progress. And what he always did, and he always considered, like many other people at the time, was that no matter what you chose and what categories you use, whites were always, by definition, by default, better. <laughs> He thought that whites had progressed and that other groups were stuck in the past, in a sense, and hadn't developed as much as white civilization. McGee took Darwin's theory of evolution and bastardized it, creating a theory to explain the physical differences between races. Darwin saw humankind as one single species. McGee saw each race as a different stage in man's evolution from the pygmy at the bottom towards the white man at the top. 